trick. Yeah. Um, so we kind of did the self-introduction. Oh, right. Hi, I'm Brian. Thanks for coming out. Cool. Thanks a lot. So we kind of did the self-introduction already, but uh, I'm Brian. Not going to pronounce my last name. Not going to pronounce my Twitter handle. That's up for you guys. Um, but <laughs> okay. So. Um, that's actually, it's a pun. There's a word in Japanese uh, that's modokashi, and the word means like timid and kind of like squirmy and like don't really know what to do with yourself. So I figured great username for me, right? <laughs> uh, so it's modokashi. Um, some people pronounce it modokash. I'm fine with that. Um, on the internet, I do this testing framework called Quick. Some of you may use it. I know some of you, may, you, you already use it. Uh, you should. It's pretty great. Um, right. Uh, and I do iOS core systems at Facebook, which I already mentioned. Uh, but right, not here to talk about Greenpoint or Facebook or whatever. We're talking about, talking about functional programming in Swift, which I am super excited about. And I'm excited by all the interest in it. Uh, and that's not necessarily because all the code that I write is super functional, right? Um, I'm a banana kind of guy. Uh, and you know, sometimes when I peel my bananas, it mutates the state of the banana. And that's... <laughs> You know, that's kind of like the code that I still write. It looks just like my Objective-C. It's kind of embarrassing and stateful. And it doesn't have any of the elements that Natasha was talking about where like pure functions are not mutating state. So here I am in imperative land. Uh, but I'm excited about Functional Swift because it gives me an opportunity to go out and kind of learn something about functional programming and maybe take back the good bits back to my day job, right? Or like to my open source projects. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, wrote quick, so you could guess that I'm kind of semi-interested in testing. Um, and so I was re really interested in going out and seeing how they do testing in functional land, right? Um, so first, just to make sure we're on the same page, how many people here have written a unit test before? Oh my god, wow, great crowd, great crowd. I was thinking about adding like a, a GIF in here where it's like, good job, but um, <laughs> wasn't sure what the response would be. So that's really cool. Uh, so I guess we could just like skip this slide, right? Because you all know that testing is all about kind of writing automated code, like code that automatically tests. It confirms that you, your app does what you think it does on a base level. There are tons of reasons to write tests, not gonna go into all of them here. Um, but you guys also know that most unit tests in imperative programming follow the same basic pattern, which is arrange, act, and assert, right? Uh, arrange, you set up the state that's necessary to run your test. Uh, you create a bunch of objects, you like create a bunch of state. Uh, act, you modify the state in some way. Or maybe you just call a function and get a return value, but a lot of times what you're gonna be doing is like flipping a flag somewhere, or, like changing state. And then in assert, you go and you make sure that the state changed in the way that you were anticipating. So like standard unit test right here. Um, I wanna test my banana. Uh, and I wanna make sure that when I call the peel function, it removes the peel from the banana, right? So again, same basic pattern. I arrange, right? Create my banana. Act, I peel that banana. And then assert that the banana has indeed been peeled. Um, this is all gonna be open source later, banana kit, it's huge. <laughs> so look forward to that. Um, but the basic premise here is, you know, frameworks like XC test, uh, they evolved in order to help you build state. They give you a setup function, they give you a teardown function. They help you manage state in your unit tests. Um, and there are other testing frameworks, right? Like, I don't know, Quick, maybe. But all of these frameworks are the same thing. Uh, arrange, right? So you set up your state. What's nice about these frameworks is they give you nested arranges, so you can do like several steps of setting up state. But it's still basically setting up state, mutating the state, checking that the state changed. So what's different in functional programming? Well, like Natasha said, functional programming, you prefer immutable objects and pure functions. It's functions that just take an input and they return some output. Um, so going back to our banana example, this is one way, not the only way, right? There's tons of ways to write functional code. This is maybe one way to write a f more functional version of our peel function, right? You're gonna give me a banana, and I'm gonna give you back a peeled banana, and that peeled banana is going to be initialized, it's just as delicious as the old banana, right? So if the old banana was awful, this new peeled one is gonna be just as bad. Uh, if the old one was great, awesome. Um, but you'll notice that I don't mutate the state of the original banana, right? I'm giving you a completely new banana object. Um, so what does a test for this look like? Well, we don't really need that much setup or 
or anything like that, right? You kind of, I could write this all on one line if I wanted to. I just create a banana, I get a peeled banana back from my function, and then I assert that the peeled banana was just as bad as the original banana. Um, so there's, since there's not so much to prepare, right, because I'm just getting inputs, there's, uh, the act step is not as important because I'm not mutating state. I'm just checking the return value of a function. So I could write it all in one line. And this is kind of the cell of functional programming, right? You spend less time worrying about state. Um, but within that frame of mind, X unit and X spec, basically testing frameworks like XC test and R spec, are kind of out of date, right? They solve the wrong problem. We don't need them to create a bunch of state anymore. Um, now, that's not to say that functional languages like Haskell don't have these frameworks. They do. Haskell has H unit, it has H spec. But the setup and teardown functions are just a minor part of those frameworks. Really, those frameworks are just designed to make it easy to write tests. Uh, they don't focus on the setup and the teardown. Instead, they focus on something different, right? And the, they focus on making better tests. And they do so by using a framework called Quick Check, right? Which is also known as property based testing. We'll get into that. But uh, Quick Check solves a different problem, and I kind of want to talk about what that problem is. Um, so if you go back to our like awful banana test, right? Awful because the banana is not delicious, not because it was a bad test. Uh, you'll notice that we're testing that a uh, awful banana, like a banana that does not taste good, tastes just as bad after it's peeled. But we don't test the case where we have a delicious banana, right? So this isn't 100% complete. We could add another test here that says if you peel a delicious banana, you get a delicious banana back, it just peeled. Um, so this is more complete, right? And this is totally possible with bools, because you only have two values. But what about if you have something that takes many values, right? What if you have an int? What if every banana had a weight? And after we peeled it, the peeled banana is just as heavy as the old one. So in this case, if we're writing our standard unit test using XC test, we would think, OK, well, maybe I'll test the base, base case, like a, a banana of weight 2, because that's what I'm going to be using this function to do. Um, but maybe some edge cases too, like what if the banana d is weightless, right? What if we're in space? Or what if I have a negative weight banana, like I'm in a black hole or something? Um, I think that's how black holes work. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in this, it's, it's cool. And I what I really like about automated testing is it forces you to think about these edge cases, right? You're, you're thinking about weightless bananas and black hole bananas that you, you never would have thought of before, maybe. Um, but we still have to think of them as developers, right? We have to come up with the test case. If I had never thought to think of black holes, I never would have had that last test. And then maybe that would have been a bug that was in my system. And I'd have to wait for some user to like get a crash. And then I'd add that example to my tests, right? So Quick Check uh, solves this problem. And the basic idea is that you don't write tests, you generate them, right? And what that means is uh, Quick Check will take tons of data Right? every integer that it can think of, and it'll throw it at your function, and it will test that certain properties of that function hold. Uh, in the case of the banana, maybe you know, the peeled banana should always weigh just as much as the original banana. That's a property, and we can test that with any integer. Um, so Quick Check uh, was first developed in Haskell in 1999, if you could believe it. Um, but now it's been ported to Objective-C and Swift, and uh, the new name for Quick Check is Fox. Um, written by Jeff Huey, who's in the audience today from Pivotal Labs. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, he helps me with a lot of quick stuff, so it's kind of cool. Um, but, right, as I mentioned, uh, the concept is called property-based testing, right? And Quick Check and Fox are property-based testing frameworks. So you, just, to be, just to get on the same page, what is a property, right? Well, like I said, that banana should weigh the same whether it's peeled or not, right? The peeled version should weigh just as much as the original. So basically, the property we're looking at is that for any integer, for all integers, uh, the original banana, when peeled, should weigh the same as the unpeeled version, right? And then we just hand this off to Fox, and Fox will run our property, we'll test it against thousands of test cases, and see where there is an exception. So you're not thinking about the edge cases. Fox finds them for, for you. Um, so you might not be impressed by Banana Kit, right? I worked really hard on it. It's, it's crushing that you don't like it. But um, 
you might want to see real code, right? So uh, there's a project by GitHub called Archimedes, which provides geometry functions for Cocoa and Cocoa Touch applications, right? Uh, one of the things that it defines is uh, insets, an insets object. And what this means is basically like you have a view, right? And this is kind of like padding in CSS. It, you, you have, in this case, 10 from the top, 5 from the left, 10 from the bottom, and 5 from the right. Uh, it's a convenient uh, construct, right? And it also, Archimedes provides a lot of convenient functions to, uh, to help us create these things. One of them is, so we can create a set of in insets. We can convert those, that set of insets into a string. So we get a string representation like this. Uh, the original set of insets was 10, 5, 10, 5, and we get a string that says 10, 5, 10, 5. Um, we can take that string, and then we can convert it to a set of insets, and that'll give us an insets object. In this case, the string was 1, 2, 3, 4. We get a set of insets that's 1, 2, 3, 4. Pretty cool, and really well tested, because it's from GitHub. Um, great team. Anyway, so you see here that there are two example-based tests. Uh, the first one says that given a set of insets, Sorry, the variable's not on the screen, but basically the set of insets is 1, 2, 3, 4. We can generate a string that's 1, 2, 3, 4. And with a set of insets that's 1.05, 2.05, 3.05, and 4.05, we can create a string that represents that as well. So why did the original developer choose these numbers? Probably not a great reason. No, like, good reason, right? It actually wasn't Justin, so. Not that this is a bad test. This is a great test. Uh, a test is an edge case. Um, but the original developer had wrote these two, and kind of assumed, like, all right, well, it's probably good enough, right? Uh, but with Fox, we could do a little better. We could say that for any four random int floats, we can, so for any of these, we can generate an in a set of insets, we can convert it to a string, convert it back to insets, and the thing that comes out should be equal to the thing that came in, right? So I can, for, for any random float, I will be able to generate it there and back. And Fox will just hammer this, right? And it might find a few edge cases. Let's say if there was a bug in here, maybe they convert the floats to ints, who knows? And then you lose everything after the decimal point. Well, so what Fox would do in this case is maybe it like throws this set of data at it. In this case, there's nothing after any of the decimal points in any of these numbers, so what comes out is the same thing, and it's fine. But maybe it runs another test case. In this case, 9.87. That's problematic, right? Because in our buggy code, it'll come out as 9.0. So Fox finds this. And most naive implementations of quick check stop here. They're like, OK, found a failing case. Here you go, dude. Um, but we, Fox does it a little better, right? Uh, what it'll do is it'll take this input and shrink it down to the minimum viable failing case. So in this case, it'll keep trying to find smaller inputs. Does the problem still reproduce, right? In 4.93, it still does. We get 4.0 back, so that's no good. So 2.46, still get uh, 2.0 back. That's no good. And we keep going until finally Fox finds this. 0 0.1 and all zeros produces 0, 0.0 and all zeros, right? So that's a pretty small test case. Can't get any smaller than that. Fox then goes into your test when you run it, displays right next code, hey, your property failed for this. Now, it's up to you to figure out what this means, right? Because Fox can find the edge cases, but it can't tell you why they're edge cases, right? So uh, you have to see this and be like, OK, 0 0.1, maybe there's something wrong with my floats. Uh, who knows? And this is really cool. And what I really like about it is that it's a concept that came out of the functional landscape um, because they were solving different problems. But we can still totally use it in our everyday code, right? You can throw this into an XC test case, and it'll work just fine. Um, but it's, and also it's not just for purely functional code, right? In this case, we're looking at like pure functions that take an input and take an output. But Fox can do one better. It can also test stateful code, right? So how does it do that? Well, I'm going to illustrate this with an example. I am actually working on a stealth mode app. I'd prefer if none of you talk about it. It's called Banana App. I know it's like, it's going to be huge, right? You tap on this. You have a number of bananas. I just so addicted to this thing on the train. It's crazy. Um, <laughs> you can add more bananas or less bananas, uh, and it increments and decrements the counter. It's all core data underneath, right? It's super complicated. <laughs> uh, oh, and I should mention, uh, you can't have less than zero bananas, and you can't have more than 10 bananas, because that would just be bananas, <laughs> right? So 
<laughs> you might look at this and you say like view controllers. Ugh, those are just like globs of state, man. Like there's no way to test that with anything that came out of functional programming. But that's not exactly true. We can test this with Fox and the way we do so is we define states and transitions, right? So from the view controller, we can transition one of two ways. We either have more bananas or less bananas by tapping on the more button or tapping on the less button. Um, so we define these transitions, and for each one of these transitions, we have to tell Fox uh, the state that you're tracking, the state that you're trying to help me track, called the model state. Uh, we have to tell it, it about that too. And we, the way we do that is by giving it a count, right? So in the initial state, you have a count. Uh, and you, when you do a more transition, the count should be one in addition to whatever the count was before, right? And the less transition is whatever the count was before minus one. And then we tell Fox that after each one of these transitions, certain core properties of our view controller has to hold. If you ever perform a transition and you check this property and it doesn't work, then we have a bug on our hands, right? So what Fox then does is it, it goes from this initial state and it just generates random arrays of state transitions, right? So it'll be like, maybe I'll tap more and then less and then more and then less. And then it'll do this several times until it finds a bug. So it, maybe it'll do more, 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 less, 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 whatever, it, completely random. Uh, and so you can kind of get like a really in-depth test of your view controller. So what does this look like, right? In code, it looks something like this. You have this more transition. Uh, you have to specify the action that Fox should take in order to perform a more transition. So you go, you grab the current state, right? There's some casting in there, I know, it's, it's a little weird. Maybe it's not the best Swift code you've ever read in your life, but it works in Objective-C too, right? So that's kind of like a, an awesome part about it. Um, you take this controller and you tap the more button on it, right? And that's, you're telling Fox, this is how you transition into the more state. You also tell Fox that when you do so, take the previous model state and now you should consider the previous model state to be that plus one, right? So increment the counter. Um, also, after you do a more transition, we're given the model state and the view controller as a variable called subject. We get the view controller, and we have to specify what condition should hold after each transition, right? So we'll say that, hey, um, get the model state, it's an int, and that should be equal to the current banana count that's displayed on the view controller, right? So after you perform a more transition, that label should have updated. Um, and we know internally that like, it, it goes out into core data and does all this crazy stuff. That's not what we care about. We care about the label has updated. Um, and we also have to specify to Fox, because if you recall, you can't have more than 10 bananas, because that would be banana, all right. Um, so we have to specify to Fox, hey, there's a precondition. You can't do a more transition if you already have, you can only do a more transition if you have less than 10 bananas, right? So finally, hooking this all up, uh, we just get a, our state machine. The initial model state, the state that we start out with, is a count of zero. Uh, we tell Fox about the add, the more and less transitions. And then we tell Fox, uh, hey, go execute these commands, right? But it, in order to execute the commands, it needs the view controller in the first place. So we create a view controller from a storyboard. Um, there are a lot of people who think that you can't test story, uh, storyboard-based view controllers. Those people should talk to me afterwards because you totally can. Uh, and this is one example of that. Anyway, so we give it a view controller and then we tell Fox, hey, go ham on this, right? Uh, and when, again, like the, the, the previous failing test case, if this ever doesn't work, it'll show you the least amount of state transitions necessary to get to that failing case. So let's say our less button wasn't working, uh, Fox would show that just one tap of the less button brings us to negative one bananas, which is bananas. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. It's on GitHub. It's open source as of this morning, which is crazy. Uh, and it has great documentation, unbelievable. So like every, I know it's hard to grok all the like different transitions that you can do while I'm talking. Uh, you can read up on it. And it's actually really cool. And um, it's also really deep, right? So like Fox is a port of property-based testing to Objective-C and Swift. But property-based testing, like I said, developed in 1999. It's been around for at least a decade. And there's a lot of literature out there. There's a lot of videos, talks, conferences about what good property-based tests are, when you would want to use them, uh, what kind of environments you can run them in, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that like, maybe we as a community kind of take this on, or maybe we determine that it's, like, it's just not, no good for iOS apps. It's up to you to decide. Um, but I definitely encourage you to check out the project.
Um, and as it grows, we can do more stuff with it, respond to feedback. Um, but yeah, so basic premise. Some of you may walk away from this talk thinking like, ah, it was a talk about Fox and Quick Check. But not necessarily, right? It's a talk about how something that was around for 15 years, we just never did in our community because we never went out into functional land, right? So there's a lot of paradigms and patterns out there that we could totally learn from and then bring back into our daily worlds. Uh, so yeah, that's about it. That's, that's the, the whole dealio. So, um, any questions? If it's when Banana Kid is coming out, I'm sorry, it's TBD, but yeah. In the example of testing the state transitions of the Banana app, I noticed that in the test you had to, you had to duplicate a bunch of behavior that would have existed in the view controller. Uh, the, the state transition for the model, incrementing and decrementing, yes. that logic would be in the view controller, as well as the conditions, uh, less than 10, greater than zero. Do you have any uh, strategies or um, any policies that you use for yourself in order to share any of that logic? So. Um, this is one aspect of the thing where it's like, uh, there's a ton of literature, right. Essentially every quick check test is going to be a duplicate of some logic. Even if you're talking about, let's say you have a base64 encoder, right? Um, that takes a string and base64 encodes it. You know, what are the properties of that? How do you test that in a generic way, right? And usually what you're gonna do is you're either gonna duplicate the function that you use to test a base64 encoder or call out to some existing base64 encoder, encode it and then compare. Um, in a similar way with the view controller test and the state transitions, we do have some du duplication. Um, you can share that just as you would share like test helpers and stuff like that. Um, but like the exact, the finer points of the strategy is definitely something that's like up for debate and something that maybe like if you, one thing that I'm, might be interesting for Fox is to provide conditions for, provide properties for you, right? So like certain properties of your view controller that are reusable among certain types of view controllers. Um, it's definitely like ripe for disruption. I use that term non-ironically at all. Yeah. Are there any speed concerns with the, how quickly the tests can run when you're doing all this generative testing and then tightening the failure cases? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to go out and say it. Fox, or rather I should say Quick Check. Quick Check was never designed to be something that's blazingly fast, right? So like if you look at the standard way that we do example-based testing, you mock out dependencies, you try and get it to run as quickly as possible because you want a tight feedback loop. Quick check isn't necessarily about that. Quick check is about finding out uh, what the edge cases are, right? So um, maybe you have it run and go off for like hours doing like hammering your functions with random input and then at the end of the night, you'll get a little email that says from your CI server or whatever that says, hey, these are the edge cases. Um, it's not so slow that you can't run it on your local box. But you should definitely, I think what people do in practice is they tweak it. So like when run locally, they run 100 iterations per property, 100 tests per property. Uh, whereas on their CI server, it's like go nuts, like hammer it for hours and see what happens. Um, but yeah, the conclusion is, the TLDR of it is, it's not meant to be fast. You can tweak it so that it's not unbearably slow. So with Fox, um, the examples that you showed were seemed like simple values, like floats. Mm -hmm. But if we had more complex values, like if a banana had a color. And yeah. Uh, so like I said, the documentation is insanely good. Uh, there are docs on generating your own values from base values. So like given random floats, strings, alphanumeric characters, from those you can generate your own random instance of your data model. Or if you really wanted to go crazy, you could uh, write your own, like your own shrinking logic, because it's not just about randomness is the problem, right? It's not just about creating a random instance of your model. It's about also when Fox says, hey, this fails, this banana fails, what is a smaller banana? Like how do I shrink this? And actually the shrinking logic is quite, uh, I don't want to say complex, because that would imply that it's not well written. Um, the, it's ingenious. And in order, to <laughs> in order to write your own shrinking logic, you also need to be a little ingenious. Um, so the, the better way to do it is definitely take all the randomness that Fox provides you with and then build up a model from that. Yeah. I have a question about bananas. So yes. what, what happens if I Sorry. leave a banana for a while and then at some time come back to it? So, so what I'm asking is, it, are you aware of any 
ways to do this for asynchronous testing. Ah. Did you experiment with that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That was the best phrased question. Um, yes, so one of the cool things about the fact that Fox is a port of QuickCheck means that we get to steal all their great ideas, right? And QuickCheck, uh, the most advanced implementation of it is in Erlang. And if you watch some of the talks for the Erlang QuickCheck, it will blow your mind because they don't just have state transitions. They also have the concept of time and concurrency and whatever. So you, you'll you'll have a system that tests your code and it will test it at random on different threads doing crazy things and then it will find edge cases. So the, the great example is um, John Hughes who, who uh, one of, is one of the co-implementers of the original QuickCheck. Uh, he live coded in an elevator scheduling system, right? And the QuickCheck tests for it had a UI, right? So your, your elevator system grew in floors grew in number of elevators per floor, grew in number of inputs on the elevator buttons, and it would go like boop, 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 and build out this huge thing as, as QuickCheck goes and finds, uh, like tries to look for edge cases. It'll eventually find one, and it'll shrink it, right? So it's like, oh, what, what just happened? And then it's like boop, 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 comes back. <laughs> and then you know, it turns out that like, if you have two elevator doors on two floors and two people press the button to go up and one to go down at the same time, the elevator door opens on a floor that it wasn't meant to open on. And it's like, yeah, I probably would have written an example-based test for that. Not, right? Like, nobody would ever think to do that. So I'm not sure there's an issue on the Fox repo that's like, let's explore this. Um, but I don't think it's implemented yet. And OK, yeah, Jeff saying no, OK. Right. Um, they actually, the Erlang version of QuickCheck, they have used it to test each EJeopardy as a chat client against simulating multiple clients. They have like multiple clients logging in, talking to each other, and they have a whole time model that can represent probabilistically when they would, uh, when it should be appropriate for certain users to receive messages. And they have complex rules about when you log on, you get the messages from the past, or you're already logged in. And so the Erlang QuickCheck version can actually log in. Right. And just for the recording, um, Erlang QuickCheck is very cool. I think it was the, the, <laughs> the gist of that. But yeah, it has, like, uh, has all these time functions, and it's pretty insane. Um, any more questions? Cool. Well, it's on GitHub. I uh, definitely encourage you to, to try it out, maybe think about how you would test your things with a property-based system. Uh, and yeah, cool. Awesome. <laughs>